1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. 2. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 3. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. 4. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 5. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. 6. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. 7. Humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. 8. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. We're going to find out who's an alcoholic. If you truly believe that you have no power over mental obsession, over the phenomenon of craving, and that your life is unmanageable. Let's turn to page 30. Page 30, paragraph 2. Page 30, paragraph 2. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. You notice that the authors aren't saying that we have to fully concede to our sponsor or the group. You will have an opportunity to examine that in a moment. In addition to that, this is what I would encourage you to do. This is the same thing my sponsor had me do. Go home and sit with me, myself, and my soul and ask myself this question. Am I willing to concede to my innermost self that I have no power and that I need a new manager? Basically, if I say, if I say yes, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying yes, I had it an abnormal reaction. Yes, I did experience the phenomenon of craving. No sufficient reason was enough to keep me sober. I lost all control once I started to drink. And I have lost the power to choose whether I will or will not drink. So you see, what's most important is conceding to myself. As long as I'm clinging to the idea that I have some power, some knowledge, some information, some memory that's going to keep me sober, there's no room for step two. Look what it says in step two. Came to believe in what? A power greater than myself. So you see, if I'm still clinging to the idea inside of me, I have some power, there's no room for that, is there? And that has been my experience. That's what happened to me in that 12 years I was bouncing in and out of these rooms. I was never willing to concede to my innermost self that I have no power. I was convinced that I had the answer, that I was smarter than everyone else, that I could still choose to not drink, that self-knowledge was the key. I was convinced of it. 
my behavior, my experiences illustrates that. If I truly believe that I don't have the power, what am I doing testing it? I'm going to drink no matter what. See, I'm faced with that every single morning that I wake up. Well, I'm going to drink today. Today's the day. I'm going to drink. Why? Because I'm going to drink no matter what. That's why I've learned to resort to the spiritual principles, the spiritual practices like prayer, meditation, evening review, working with others, telling other people what's going on with me. So everybody that is here to take the steps, please stand. We are going to consider the questions that I've just reviewed. And we'll go around the room one at a time. After you answer, please be seated. And I'll begin. Am I willing to concede to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic? Yes. Congratulations. My hope for you is that you had a first step experience. And what I mean by that is this. I was taking this guy through the steps and and we went through this. We spent a great deal of time on these 43 pages. And we got to the end and I said, so, how's it feel knowing that there's absolutely nothing you can do to keep yourself sober? He said, oh, it feels pretty good. I went, what? We, we overlook something here, okay? It's not supposed to feel good. If you're feeling good, you probably did not have a first step experience. It. Consider it. If you are a real alcoholic, how promising does it sound that there's nothing you can do to keep you sober? Is that going to make me feel good? Of course not. I'm supposed to have that experience. Now I'm in a position to seek power. So, I'm not going to leave you hanging there. I'd like to give you a little bit of hope before you leave. Okay, let's turn to page 46. Page 46, paragraph 2, line 5. Page 46, paragraph 2, line 5. This is part of the second step. This is what we have to look forward to. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. Check out the key word new. It doesn't say sense of power. You're not going to get sense of power. I'm going to receive new sense of power. New, that means unlike anything I've ever experienced before. Wow. New direction, not direction, new direction. I'm going to receive power like I've never experienced it before, and I'm going to have a direction to go that I've never had before. Does that sound wonderful? How many people in here want that? Yeah, me too. That's what we have to look forward to. In preparation for next week, I would recommend that you read pages 44 to 71. To prepare us for steps two, three, and four. So we're for so this week we're going to read pages forty-four to seventy-one until we meet next week. I want to welcome all of you to the fellowship of the Spirit. And those of you that are on your way to being rocketed into the fourth dimension, congratulations for what you've done today and thank you.
do and pick up where we left off last week. Let's turn to page 59 and let's read step two where it says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, when I first took the second step, I had expectations. <laughs> I, had, I had expectations of being returned to sanity. And I was gravely disappointed when I was not. Because I thought that that's what the second step meant, that I would be returned to sanity. But notice that the authors say, could restore us to sanity. And to give you a glimpse of what to look forward to, we're going to jump ahead just for a moment and turn to page 84. Page 84, paragraph 3. Page 84, paragraph 3. Now, at this time in the book, we are at step 10. So when we get to step 10, which implies we've already done an inventory, we've taken the exact nature of our wrongs to God in step 6 and 7. We've compiled our list of people we've harmed and we're actively making amends. So providing we've done that, this is what we are going to experience in step 10. Notice what it says in that paragraph. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time, sanity will have returned. (laughs) So, if you're anything like me and you have the delusion that your sanity is going to be returned simply by choosing a, a power greater than yourself, I was gravely mistaken when that happened. So, just keep that in mind. Let's turn to page 44. Page 44 is the chapter we agnostics. This chapter is entirely devoted to step two. Notice what the authors have to say in in the first paragraph. It says, in the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. Notice where they pick up, right where we left off on page 43. The authors are recapping what we've learned up to this point. In other words, am I clear on what a real alcoholic is? Am I clear on what a non-alcoholic is? If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Here the authors, one more time, are emphasizing what is the real alcoholic, And that the solution for being a real alcoholic is spiritual. So let's turn that into a question and consider that for yourself. Are you willing to believe that you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer? Consider that for a moment. In other words, do you have the power to conquer your alcoholism? Do you have the power to not drink? Keeping in mind what we discussed last week about conceding to our innermost selves that we don't have any power. I'm a real alcoholic as described on page 21. And that Alcoholics Anonymous is not about not drinking. I thought it was. And how come you people didn't show me how not to drink? Because that's not what it's about. As a result of conceding to my innermost self that I have no power, then I have a desire to seek a power greater than me providing I had a first step experience. So you see, if I don't have that first step experience, there's no desire to seek any power. Why do it? So if I'm still clinging to the idea that I have some choices left, (laughs) that I can just simply choose and not drink. Well, see, if I could simply choose, what am I doing here? If I could just simply choose to drink or not drink, what am I doing going to AA? And one more time, if you believe that you have that power to choose, why didn't you exercise that power before now? I can't tell you how many times I've worked with guys, take them through the steps, and I hear the response, well, I chose to stop drinking a lot of times. Really? Then how come you drank again? Listen to the statement. Having the power to choose to quit, to stop. If I'm going to quit or stop, that means I'm going to quit and stop. (laughs) <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to pick it up again. That's not quitting and that's not stopping. Okay, page 45, paragraph 1. 
page 45, paragraph 1. Lack of power. One more time, they're re-emphasizing this again and again. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously, but where and how were we to find this power? In a moment, we're going to answer those two questions. So I have in my book underlined how and where. So in a moment, we're going to find out where we're going to find this power and how we're going to find it. That's what I love about this book. Simple set of instructions. Okay, now I've had a first step experience. I have a desire to seek some power because my life is so unmanageable. I want it to improve. I have to find some power. Well, where am I going to find it? Maybe I can find it in you, in her, in that boat, in that money, in that car, in that job. Right? Maybe. I don't know. Next paragraph. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. They're telling us right here what the main object of the book is. Now, I'm not the smartest kid on the block, but I did put this much together. Okay. If the purpose, if the object of the book is to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. Now, what is my problem? It tells me on page 23 what my problem is. It's my thinking. It's not alcohol. Alcohol was my solution. <laughs> That's what it was for me. It became a problem, but it was my solution. So, see, my main problem isn't drinking. It's my thinking. So, the authors are telling me that the object of the book is to find a power that's going to help me with that. Now, they're talking about finding a God of my understanding. Not yours. Not my father's. Not the clergy's. But mine. So, consider this. If the main object of the book is to enable me to find a God of my understanding, what's the purpose of the 12 steps, considering they are contained in the book? It's to find a God of my understanding. That is the purpose of the 12 steps. Let's answer those questions. The, the where and the how. Let's turn to page 55. Page 55, paragraph 2. Page 55, paragraph 2. Actually, we were fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Wow. It's inside of me. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. But in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. Isn't that beautiful? That's where I'm going to find it. That's where I'm going to find my higher power, my understanding of God. It's not going to be out there. It's not going to be up in the sky. It's going to be inside. The authors continue by saying, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup. Just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. But he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. So clear and precise. Where I'm going to find it? Deep inside of me. How am I going to find it? By searching fearlessly. Keep in mind, to, to do something fearlessly does not mean absence of fear. It simply means I can be afraid of something, but I go ahead and do it anyway or try it. That's to search fearlessly. To illustrate that, I have a friend who's a fireman. And I asked him one day, What's that? aren't you afraid to go into that building? He said, absolutely, I'm terrified. Then why do you do it? He says, because those people need help. So you see, he has the courage to go into that burning building, even though he may be afraid. Something to consider. If there's no fear involved, there's no need for courage. How many people brush their teeth this morning? I don't want to embarrass anybody, okay? <laughs> 
But do you see what I'm saying? Did it, did it require any courage to brush your teeth? There was no fear involved in that, was there? How many people, let me see a show of hands, how many people were afraid to do a four-step the first time you did it? Same here. I was afraid. I went ahead and did it. Why? Because I was willing to search fearlessly. Let's turn to page 46. Page 46, paragraph 1, line 3. Page 46, paragraph 1, line 3. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. Wow. That's a promise. Even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. We haven't done anything. All I've done in step one is conceded to my innermost self that I have no power. I cannot produce a spiritual experience for myself. And all I'm doing in step two is becoming willing. That's all I'm doing in step two. Am I willing to believe in something more powerful than me? And here the authors are telling us that as soon as we're able to lay aside this prejudice and even ex- and express even a willingness, they're not even asking us to believe. So you see, I don't have to believe, just a willingness to believe that I convinced to get results. You know what convince means? It means to begin. I must be slow because I've been beginning for over 20 years. <laughs> I'm still commencing to get results. Oh, that's great. And it's impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. Okay, consider this. In order for me to fully understand God, is to be God. So will I ever fully understand God? No. The God of my understanding? I will never fully understand that. Another thing that I've experienced in sobriety is that it is impossible for me to get closer to God. How many times have you heard people say, yeah, I'm getting closer to God? We just read on page 55, where am I going to find this fundamental idea of God deep inside of me? How can I get any closer than that? It's impossible to get any closer than that. It may be obscured by pomp, worship of other things, etc., etc. Now, As a result of doing the disciplines and doing repeated step work, I may have a deeper understanding. I may have a deeper relationship with the God of my understanding, but I'm not really any closer. Can't get any closer than that. Next paragraph. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. It doesn't have to match someone else's. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. You know what possessed means? Driven. I'm going to be driven. Once again, we haven't even taken any of the action steps. And already the authors are promising me by having a simple willingness to believe I'm going to be driven by a, not sense of power, new sense of power. That means power unlike anything I've ever experienced before. New direction. Not direction, but a new sense of direction. I'm going to find myself going in a different way than I did before, provided I took other simple steps. Paragraph 1, page 47. Paragraph 1, page 47. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. What's most important here is that it makes sense to you. It doesn't have to make sense to me. The God of my understanding doesn't have to make sense to my sponsor. It doesn't have to make sense to the AA group I belong to but rather it makes sense to me. In early sobriety, I was having some difficulty and I was having a problem with this God thing and I ended up talking to this old timer after the meeting. He said, here, why don't you borrow my my higher power for the weekend? I said, okay, you can do that? I can borrow your God? 
for a weekend? He said, well, he's been keeping me sober for 12 years. I think he can spare a little time for you. I said, okay. That was over 20 years ago that I had the same guy. <laughs> the same God. Isn't that amazing? This guy let me borrow his God, and I still have the same God with me today. What's important is that it made sense to me. Now, something to consider before we move on in step two. That it's essential that it be a power greater than me. It cannot be something that I can destroy or something that I have power over. I've heard some pretty funny things in meetings about people's choice of higher power. I've heard people say, you could call it a doorknob. You could call it a rock. Let's imagine that you have a great big rock in your backyard. By the way, this is based on a true story that I heard from a guy. <laughs> he had this huge boulder in his backyard. He said, yep, that's my higher power. Okay. Let's put that to the test. Let's put that rock in the steps. Okay. Came to believe that a rock could restore me to sanity. Step two. Huh, that's interesting. Let's see, step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of the rock as I understood it. <laughs> oh, well. Let's see, step five. Admitted to my rock, to myself and another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. <laughs> oh, well, I love this one, too. Step six. We're entirely ready to have my rock remove all these defects of character. <laughs> You gotta be careful where you use this example. You want to, you don't want to use this particular example in Cocaine Anonymous, okay? All right. <laughs> but, the, but this is AA, okay? We can do it here, okay? Not use it, talk about it, okay? All right. <laughs> oh, check this one out. Step seven. Humbly ask my rock to remove my shortcomings. Certainly, okay. Let's, uh, let's jump down here. Look, oh, look what it says in. Uh, Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to prove our conscious contact with my rock. As I understood it, praying only for the knowledge of my rock's will for me and the power to carry it out. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, boy. We're just so easily amused, aren't we? I need no one to entertain me up here. <laughs> me and my mind, we're just having a gay old time. The point is, make sure it's a power greater than you. I used women for a while, and that didn't work very well. So all we're being asked is to have a willingness to believe a power greater than us. In other words, a God of your understanding. Remember what we assessed in step one, that we admitted that there was very little hope for us unless we had an entire psychic change. And that no human power could produce that essential psychic change. So that means I need to find a power. Okay, page 47, paragraph 2. Page 47, paragraph 2. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. When a mason is building an arch out of brick, the very first brick that they put in place is called the cornerstone. The outcome of that arch is contingent. It's dependent upon the positioning of that very first brick. So you see, that's our cornerstone. Our cornerstone is simply having a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. Let's turn to page 53. Page 53, paragraph 2. Page 53, paragraph 2. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? A couple of questions to consider. Did I become alcoholic? Was I crushed by a self-imposed crisis? In other words, 
I did it to myself. You didn't do it to me. She didn't do it to me. The employer didn't do it. I did it to me that I couldn't postpone or evade. So here the authors are asking us to consider making a choice. Am I willing to make that choice? That either God is everything or he's nothing. And there's even a question mark in that last sentence, which indicates that's a stop sign. That means when I see a question mark in the book, that means I stop and I answer that question. So what is my choice to be? God is either everything or he's nothing. So these are the questions that we're going to consider with step two. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask that everybody stand and we're going to ask two questions. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? So I'm, I'm, I'm either going to answer that yes or no. Yes, I do believe or I don't. The second question is, what is my choice? Is God everything or is he nothing? I will start. After you respond, please be seated. Yes, I am willing to believe in God is everything. Congratulations. Okay, let's move on to step three. Let's turn to page.